You are listening to Woodland Walks, a podcast for the Woodland Trust, presented by Adam Shaw. We protect and plant trees for people, for wildlife. When most people think about rainforests, they're imagining the tropical, densely overgrown jungles of, well, mainly of our imagination, because so few of us have actually been there. But what they don't think about is the rainforests of places as close to home as a Devonshire cream tea. And that's what's so shocking because Devon and some other parts of the UK have in fact some of the most important temperate rainforests the world knows. And it's shocking not only because it's a bit of a surprise that we have these rainforests, but we've not really been taking much care of them. The ecologist Dominic de la Sala said that today's European rainforests are mere fragments, a reminder of a bygone era when rainforests flourished and they're now barely hanging on as contemporary rainforest relics. Well, I'm off to see, well, I hate to describe it as one of those relics, but one of those jewels that remains with us in Devon to see what a British rainforest looks like why it's important, and what's fun about it. Well, I've come to Bovey Valley Woods, uh, which, unsurprisingly, I suppose, lies in the valley of the river Bovey, on the southeast side of Dartmoor National Park, uh, and rather close to Newton Abbot. You might have heard of that. Uh, There are lots of trees, and there are lots of wildlife here uh, brimming with uh, spring migrant birds. So uh, we might come across the Dartford warbler, the brightly coloured kingfisher or the pied flycatcher, uh, which arrives from Africa each spring to breed. We might come across some rather tiny hazel dormice, which I understand are here as well. I'm not here at night, but apparently if you are, there are lots of bats which hunt on the wing. And of course, uh, there's the Dartmoor ponies which graze in the wildflower meadows around here. But we are planning on heading into the wood itself. My name is David Rickwood uh, and I work for the Woodland Trust and I'm site manager here at Bovey Valley Woods. Well just describe to me sort of what we're looking out at now. We can, I can hear a stream somewhere nearby, um, so there's clearly that down in the valley, but describe what, what's going on around us. Yeah, so we're on the eastern edge of Dartmoor. There are nine river systems that rise on, on Dartmoor. They carve these kind of deep valley systems off the edge of the moor. So a lot of people, when they imagine Dartmoor, they're thinking about the big open expanses of the moorland. But actually all of these river valley systems are where the concentrations of ancient woodland and temperate rainforest sit. You know, they have this kind of ambient temperature all year round, so we don't have these extremes of heat and cold. uh, And they provide those kind of perfect conditions, really. Yeah, I mean, when one thinks of Dartmoor, it is those, those bare, sort of rather dramatic landscapes. But you're saying hidden in the creases around those are these, these rich, temperate rainforest environments. A- absolutely, you see. So although people think of the open moorland of Dartmoor and the high moor, um, actually a lot of that biodiversity and a lot of the diversity is around the edges in these wooded valleys. So woodland bird assemblages is particularly important in this part of the world. So species like pied flycatcher, wood warbler, uh, invertebrates like blue ground beetle, and of course, all of these lichens, mosses, and liverworts uh, that are, you know, in these sort of niches in these temperate rainforests. Right, so we've jumped into this discussion about rainforest, uh, and we're in a temperate rainforest, but I'm still not sure what a temperate rainforest is because it conjures up this image sort of of jungle, doesn't it? Of hacking back dense forestry of the Amazon, of sort of Victorian explorers. That's not the environment we're in, which leads, I think, me to a confusion. I think lots of people are confused about what it is we're talking about. How would you define a, a rainforest then? Okay, so in visual terms, 
A lot of the trees around here have what they call epiphytic plants. There's things growing on the trees, there's things growing on the rocks, there's things growing on other plants, and you get this lush abundance of particularly mosses. Yeah. So, so sorry, the epiphytic, it means it's living on it, but it's not actually taking its energy from that. So it's, it's, it's quite a beneficial relationship. Yeah, so if you were to go and look at a tree branch in, say, central London, you're not going to see it carpeted in mosses and lichen. So here, the air quality is very high, um, and so you get this abundance of, uh, of plants growing on other plants. And because it's so wet, moist and damp, throughout the year, those plants can survive actually quite high in the canopy. So the sorts of things that you're seeing in a rainforest are lichens. The trees aren't particularly different from trees you'd see elsewhere, are they? The oaks and all of that. So it is, it's, lichens are a big uh, identifier and the amount of rain, presumably. Absolutely. So, yeah. So we're talking about sort of 200 days a year where rainfall is occurring in some form. That might actually be cloud, just wet mist. Right. Um, not necessarily pouring down with rain. Um, and we're also talking about uh, rainfall in excess of say 12 to 1400 millimetres a year. And we're very lucky that we're in a rainforest and it's not raining. Uh, well, it's lucky for me. Um, so uh, now this is, a, tell me about this piece of woodland itself. And we're right on the edge of the moorland. Um, and so the woodland here is gradually creeping out onto the edge of the moor. Uh, and it's spread out from these kind of core areas in the valley. Now that's brilliant in terms of uh, renaturalizing the landscape, but actually it can be quite problematic for some of the species in temperate rainforest. So in particular on this site here, we've got lots of very old veteran trees and ancient trees that grew in a landscape that was a bit more open, had a lot more light. And it's those trees that often have some of these really key species assemblages like on base rich bark, or what they call dry bark communities. So it's all quite niche in terms of the conversation, but those trees are really the stars in this valley. Um, and so whilst we're kind of managing the woodland here, um, we need to give uh, you know, conscious effort to kind of manage around some of those key areas. So look, let's go off into the woodland, but just to, to tell me a bit about what we're gonna see, the plan for the day. Okay, so the plan for the day is we're gonna just well, walk down this track here and we're going to drop down to a place called Hisley Bridge and that crosses the River Bovey um, and that in itself is a very enchanting and be beautiful place and I think probably some of this mystery uh, around a, a temperate rainforest will start to fall into place when you see that. Well let's go, well, let's go off, but I tell you what, before we, before we go off on that adventure, just, just pause for a moment, let's listen to that babbling brook. So we're talking about this rainforest in recovery or trying to build a rainforest here almost. How delicate is this environment? Um, it's interesting. I think probably in the past five or ten years, I think we've become increasingly aware, particularly through working with partners like Plant Life, actually how vulnerable these sites are. And, and how the changing climate is going to be a real threat to sites like this. Um, and whilst we're doing our best in terms of managing the site and trying to restore it uh, and trying to create the right kind of conditions, there are some aspects about climate that we cannot manage. And so resilience is really this, this much sought after um, objective um, and I think on a site like this it provides an interesting template because over the past hundred years this site has kind of spread out into the wider landscape. That expansion has created an element of resilience for us. I'm not sure I fully understand you're saying you, there is some resilience because of the expansion of it but yeah. I, how does that create resilience? So things like lichens, yeah. so, so this, this site in particular is really important for lichens um, and Hisley Wood on the other side of the river is probably one of a handful of sites in England. 
As this woodland has expanded, it's allowed some of those species to actually move into the wider landscape. Right. So instead of there maybe being three or four oak trees with a particular species here, yeah. there might be a hundred oak trees with those species. So the fact you've got more of them makes the whole thing more resilient. If something happens to one, it's not a disaster. Yeah. Understood. So given my feet are very wet, I, I need new boots. <laughs> just, to, just to tell you if I'm grimacing, it's nothing to do with you. Um, oh, I was gonna to talk to you, but look at this. That is a bridge straight out of The Hobbit. Just, I mean, so <laughs> this is extraordinary. Tell, tell me about that. Um, so this here um, uh, is a historic bridge that would have provided the access to Bavicam Farmstead. Um, so Bavicam Farmstead probably is medieval in origin, but the, the structure that there's now is abandoned. This is, I mean, just describe it. It's, it's made of rocks and it looks so haphazardly done. It's straight out of, you do it in a film, isn't it? I mean, it's very high up, very sharp down. It is absolutely beautiful. I'm going to insist I take a photo of you on it. Uh, and, and it's a lovely flowing river right underneath it as well. Yeah, so this is the River Bovey uh, and about 200, uh, 300 metres upstream. Um, it's, there's the confluence of the River Bovey and the Becker Brook. Um, and these are sort of torrent rivers, so they go up and down really quickly with the rainfall. So this area here and the bridge, in fact, at times becomes an island because the river comes up so high. Well, where we are now? We've yeah, so if you look at all of these stones, they're all water washed. Right. And you can see the sand from the right. riverbed that's oh, been washed out here. Yeah, I can over there, it's amazing. Um, so coming here, you know, uh, particularly in the autumn last year, November, December, or the late autumn when we had a lot of rain, yeah, this was kind of underwater at this point. Um, but these rivers are really important or uh, really important for things like salmon, spawning salmon, in this sea river trout. Here? Yeah. So these, it's these kind of rivers that really would have had an abundance of salmon and sea trout in the past. Do you still get some? Yeah, we still get some now. And interestingly, even though it was super dry last July and the salmon numbers were the best they've been for probably five or 10 years. I have many things to ask you, but we are gonna to have to take a pause here as I take a photo. Um, okay, yeah, so uh, there's salmon. What other sort of wildlife have we got here? So. I don't know if you can just look across the river there, but there's a, an oak tree uh, and underneath the oak tree, the root plate has been hollowed out by the river. Yeah, 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 I can see that, yeah. So it cool. almost looks like there's nothing supporting that tree. Well, interestingly, it does flex up and down, but that actually is an otter hole. So uh, the otters move through this area uh, on a regular basis. Um, and we've got a great little bit of footage actually of a mother with two kits uh, in there and they're in there for a a brief while but um, these rivers are really good uh, and things like otters are a really good sign that the fish population is good so there would be dippers on the river here kingfishers grey wagtails so I, I got distracted by the beautiful bridge um, but it is all what I wanted to ask you about this is such a, a sort of environment on the edge um, that you're trying to protect but at the same time, it's Woodland Trust policy to encourage engagement to people to visit. In this particular area, in this particular circumstance, is that a very difficult decision? Because actually you're going, hold on a second, we do want people to engage. On the other hand, th this is an environment which really needs to be left alone for a while. Uh, do you feel that tension at all? Yeah, that's, that is uh, an ongoing issue. Um, and uh, so, for example, here, one of the things we try to discourage, and we do that by just felling trees or uh, putting in what you might describe as natural barriers, is we try and discourage some access to the river in certain areas, for example, like dogs. So dogs and the otter hole, et cetera, is not a great, great mix. And then you've got species like dipper that are nesting in these tiny little, really, balls of fern and grass along the edges here and it's very very easy 
for both a person, let alone a dog, to just flip those chicks out of their nest. Oh, talking by you, a black Labrador just <laughs> dipping into the river there. I mean, th there's this sense of, you know, sort of called honeypot uh, sort of attractions. And that was an issue, I think, particularly in Dartmoor over lockdown, wasn't it? Where it's sort of places became overwhelmed. And I suppose, again, there's a tension, isn't there? On the one hand, they can get overwhelmed. On the other hand, if you manage that well, it drags all people to the big famous place and leaves the quieter places on their own. So it's a two-sided coin. Do you, what, do you think that's a, a good argument or not? You're smiling at me. It's almost going, oh, no, he's talking rubbish. No, <laughs> no, no, on the contrary, I think we have got to learn to manage it. Um, and I think there's a number of aspects of that. I think we can try and draw people away from areas that we consider to be more sensitive. I think we need to engage people and try and broaden everybody's understanding of what's important about these places. Because the more people that appreciate them, love them, and understand some of the nuance, and it is nuance, um, the more likely we are to be able to protect these places in the future uh, and you know, for them to be sustained. We've got a lot of traveling to do and not much time. So let's cross the bridge and you're taking me to some, some lichen. Oh God, I'm just chipping over. <laughs> there we are, okay. <laughs> right, we're, go we're, we're going lichen hunting. We are gonna go lichen hunting. God. Although this isn't actually the best example, but there you go. Can you see these, oh. there are these little teeth. Little teeth underneath the lichen, and so that's why that's called dog lichen. Yeah, and that's, it's part of a group of lichens that, that behave in that way, and they use those to actually attach itself to the moss or the rock. That's, That's not the nicest lichen I've seen. It looks no. very crumbly to me. It looks a bit dry. It does yeah. look a bit dry. Is that how it's meant to look? Well, you know, obviously we've had a very long dry spell. And now, I've just picked up a stick and this is covered in the lichen I love. Yeah. But what is that? Do you know what, do you know what that's called? No, you see, oh, I'm sorry, I've embarrassed no, you. Know. No, I, not, yeah, I can't. Not sure. <laughs> don't worry about no. it. You don't have to know every bit of lichen. No. <laughs> It's palm uh, something or other. Palmelia. Pa palmelia, that's it. Palmelia. Palmelia. You see the noises off from his lichen advisors. Uh, palmelia. I think it's so pretty, it's nicer than jewellery or something, you know. I think that's very nice. So, okay. So we're heading down the other bank of the river. And where are you taking me, Dave? Well, we're going to head down to a meadow um, that was cleared of conifer about 20 years ago um, and so that's where part of this site has been restored but on the way we're going to have a look at a, a big ash tree and an oak tree that overhangs the river um, and that has a particular type of lichen um, called the lungwort growing on it. What a horrible name, the lungwort. And then, what was that? Tell me if this is true. That was it the Victorians then gave them these names? Oh no, actually it would have been before that, wouldn't it? Because it looked like an organ and they thought it, therefore it was medicinal. Oh, well it looks like a lung, therefore if you've got a lung disease you should eat that. Yeah, so that's exactly what, uh, what it was. So this one looks like the inside of the lung, so it looks almost like the alve alveoli right. of the inside. And people thought it was some kind of medic medicinal kind of treatment Which for any kind of ailment. We should tell people don't eat this stuff. No, it's don't eat it and it. certainly don't cut it or pick it because yeah. it really is quite a rare species. And that's this? Yeah, so there's, a, there's, there's several little pieces on this tree here. Because I'm right by the river holding my phone, my recorder. And if you hear a big splash, that'll be me going into the river. Right, yeah. Also, don't want to tread on all the lichens. Yeah, go on. So it's this one here, which is looking a bit dry and crusty at the oh, moment. Yeah. Um, uh, so this is, the, this is the lung work, but if you look carefully, this is an ash tree. Right. And this ash tree actually is dying. It's going to say, is this an ash dieback? Yeah, so this is uh, one of the trees that really will probably succumb to ash dieback in due course. But this one, thankfully, is leaning into this really big oak tree next door. Um, and the lungwort has managed actually to migrate across onto the oak. Can you see there's some yes. small fragments here? And further up there's more fragments. So this is where potentially the loss of one species um, may be quite significant for the, for the lichens that are growing on it. And do you get involved? Do you give it a bit of a helping hand and sort of 
pick one up and put it over on the yoke? Does that, is that a thing that happens? So we haven't done here, but that kind of translocation approach is being practiced in some areas, particularly where the sites are almost pure ash. So this site here, we've got a range of species that lungwort can probably actually grow on. So we probably don't need to go down that route yet. But on some sites, it's really critical. So they are translocating it. I love that. I got it. picking up and put it down and you very neatly go, that's called translocation, but you did it politely. So you didn't make me sound an idiot. And I'll tell you what, I can't, I can't, I want a photo of the lungwort, but I'm just, I, I can't come over that close. I'm going to fall in. So okay. I'll give you my phone and you can take a picture. And that way I won't be climbing all over the place. Oh, God. Me... Well, joining us with our band of merry men and women uh, is actually someone who's responsible for a lot of work behind the scenes and actually bringing people together to make projects like this, this rejuvenation of this temperate rainforest possible. Um, so I'm Eleanor Lewis and I am the Southwest uh, Partnership Lead for the Woodland Trust. I know one of the big problems with these projects is that the Woodland Trust can't, perhaps doesn't even want to do them by themselves. So actually bringing in local communities, other organisations is super important. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, the enormity of the kind of crises we face in terms of kind of climate change um, and biodiversity in nature just mean that no single organisation can do it on their own. And we can be so much more powerful and have far greater impact um, if we join together um, and create kind of partnerships and work at a landscape scale. So that's a fundamental part of my role really, is identifying those kind of opportunities um, and working with other organisations to basically amplify all of our kind of organisational objectives. So at the moment we're seeking to kind of establish um, an alliance for the Southwest Rainforest. So that's um, everyone from kind of Devon um, Wildlife Trust, Somerset Wildlife Trust, the National Trust, um, and then you've got kind of plant life, um, RSPB, there's too many to kind of to name, but a really kind of good mix um, of environmental um, kind of charities, but also those kind of policy makers. So we've been having conversations with Natural England and the Forestry Commission. So what are you trying to get out of that association? I think there's a number of different things. So there is already an existing alliance in Scotland, so the Alliance for Scotland's Rainforest. And I think one of the key things that has demonstrated is actually the power of having a kind of a coherent communications plan and, and therefore having a kind of one voice um, that is coming from all of these organisations saying this is important, this is under threat and this is what we need to do um, is a really kind of key aim of the Alliance. Well, Eleanor, uh, thank you very much indeed. I do, I mean, I really do understand that sort of better together spirit really does help to achieve amazing things. So best of luck with that. I'm going to go off. D Dave is down there and I can see he's he's joined by a colleague, I think, uh, there. So I'm going to go back and join them. But for the moment, thanks. Thanks very much indeed. So my name's Tom, Tom Pinches. Um, and um, we're contractors and consultants who work in the countryside. And you're brought in to sort of identify trees. It's called what this rapid, sounds very flashy. It's like you're the SAS of tree men, your rapid reaction force. What is it called? It's called the rapid rainforest assessment. Right. And what the, what the, is the, the rapid the rainforest assessment? The then? assessment formerly known as the rapid woodland assessment. Oh, okay. It, it went through a little bit of a rebranding exercise. Right. So um, what is it? So uh, the key word there is rapid. Um, so it's basically a toolkit which was developed by Plant Life to, um, to easily identify temperate rainforests. I mean, my role as, uh, as a consultant really was to work with the volunteers. Right. Um, so showing them how to use this toolkit. Yeah. So um, in theory, it can be used by um, people with, with less experience of ecological surveys. Um, but there is some nuance there which um, requires a little bit of a uh, little bit of knowledge. And so what sort of things are you testing? What, what, what are the, the characteristics you're trying to find to identify this, this temperate rainforest? So it, it can be quite difficult to identify habitats and, um, and that's something which ecologists have been struggling with for a while because there's no single um, identifying feature. Um, so historically it was done by identifying um, indicator species. Um, in certain habitats you tend to get communities 
of, of species which, which you find in that habitat. Um, the problem with um, temperate rainforest is that um, those indicator species are, um, are plants like um, uh, bryophytes, lichens, uh, liverworts, mosses, which are very specialist. Not, not that many people can identify them. But the other things you can do are identify characteristics of the habitat. So these communities of species tend to be found in certain, uh, certain types of places. So one of the things we were looking at was, uh, was the structure of the woodland. We were looking at the age structure. Um, we were looking at the amount of canopy cover. So those things are really important in temperate rainforest. Okay, so that's really critical. So this isn't Amazon rainforest transplanted to Devon tea land. No. This is, it does look different from so, a, a jungle absolutely. type Amazon. So the similarity is that they both require um, high rainfall. Right. So which is why you find them um, on, the, um, on the western edge of the right. UK where there's, where there's a lot of rainfall. Okay. And I don't want to get obsessed by this, but why is it important that we identify this as rainforest? Look, it looks just a very nice forest to me. Um, in fact, whether we call it temperate rainforest or just a bit of forest doesn't seem to me to be that important. Why is it? I mean, so temperate rainforest is, is an incredibly rare habitat. So you could ask, why should we be conserving any incredibly rare habitats? I think as a, as a society, as, an, as, a, as, a, as a population, we all agree that, that rare plants and rare habitats should be conserved. Right. And so it's really important to identify them in order that we can conserve them. You know, we talk about diversity. We talk about diversity um, of species, biological diversity, diversity of habitats. And each of those sub-habitats have their own biological diversity, bi biological uniqueness. Um, and it's really important that we, that we can identify as much nuance within those habitats and within that biological complexity as we can. So we can kind of save as much as we can that's sort of under threat. And it's beautiful as well, isn't it? It is, yeah, it's really beautiful. They're some of the, I think they're some of the most beautiful habitats um, in the country, certainly in the country maybe even the world, very Tolkien-esque, yeah. you know? It is, uh, uh, as we crossed that bridge, I said, if you're making a film of The Hobbit, that's what you put in The Hobbit. Absolutely, and, I, and, and, and you know, these are habitats that inspired people like Tolkien to yes. write about woodlands. There is something mystical about them, isn't there? They do feel sort of magical places, there's a weird stuff feel, could happen, like stories. They feel, is, they feel timeless and, and ancient, yes. and that's because they are ancient, yeah. right? And that's why they're so important because they're so old and they're so ancient. You know, these really valuable habitats, they're there because they've had so long, um, such a, a long amount of time undisturbed yeah. to develop the diversity that they have. Yeah. Well, that is a fantastic point to end on, Tom. Uh, and we are right in the middle of the woods right now and I have a train to catch, so I've got to make my way out of this place. So, Tom, thank you very much. Of course, my thanks to Eleanor and Dave uh, and even the birds the trees, the muds and the rivers which have given us our wonderful soundtrack for today. Uh, thank you for listening. If you want to find a wood near you, be it a temperate rainforest or something a little less exotic even, you can find uh, a wood near you by going to woodlandtrust.org.uk forward stroke find a wood. That's woodlandtrust.org.uk forward stroke find a wood. Until next time... Happy wandering. Thank you for listening to the Woodland Trust Woodland Walks with Adam Shaw. Join us next month when Adam will be taking another walk in the company of Woodland Trust staff, partners and volunteers. Don't forget to subscribe to the series on iTunes or wherever you are listening to us and do give us a review and a rating. And why not send us a recording of your favourite Woodland Walk to be included in a future podcast? Keep it to a maximum of five minutes and please tell us what makes your woodland walk special. Or send us an email with details of your favourite walk and what makes it special to you. Send any audio files to podcast at woodlandtrust.org.uk. We look forward to hearing from you.